yeah, I can hear you too. Good, good. Sorry, was some problem with my. Not that I have much to say other than introduce you, and so. But uh, but now that my microphone is working, I'm very happy to introduce our old very own Noah, speaking from London. I guess. Okay, is that is that London? Yeah, background? yeah, it's London. Yeah, so yeah, part of it. Yeah. So uh, so I think. Uh, You've disappeared. Yeah, I think I got mute. Or is it still? I'm still. Can you still hear me? Or? I can still hear you. Yeah, you disappeared yeah. for a second. Not sure what's. Uh, some uh, the Zoom is in, informing me that my headset is disconnected. I'm not sure. I think I can hear you fine. So anyway, I think we're uh, we we're ready for. Uh, so I can hear you. I hope everybody can hear you. We can see your screen, and I think you can just take it from here. Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. One small upside to the, the global situation is that it's much easier to attend the seminar now. So it's a pleasure to speak. Um, so we're going to talk about quad schemes, but, but they're going to live inside some nicer variety with which we're more familiar um, called instanton moduli space. And so let me just remind everyone what that is. So I, moduli space of sheaves. So in particular, I'll, I'm interested in torsion-free sheaves on P2. And these spaces, this, this uh, space of frame torsion-free sheaves divides into components that are indexed by the rank of the sheaf. So we'll say MRN will be the, the space of sheaves of uh, rank R and, and second churn class equal to N. And these sheaves will also come with a framing. So it's a framing that's an isomorphism between the restriction of the sheaf to the line at infinity in P2 and R copies, so rank R sheaf, so R copies of the structure sheaf of this line at infinity. I guess I don't need the uh, restriction there. And this space has a automorphisms. It has a, a large torus acting. And so we'll write down what these two different tori are. Um, there'll be a two-dimensional torus that just acts on P2. And so that'll write in green. And there'll be an R minus one dimensional torus, or, or rather, we'll write it as an R-dimensional torus who's center acts trivially called A, and that acts by scaling the framing. And so this is a smooth moduli space, and it's of dimension 2Rn. OK, great. Um, and, and this space, as I mentioned, is also a, an example of a, a Nakajima quiver variety. And so we. Did we see this quiver in Henry's talk? Possibly. I take the Jordan quiver, uh, so it's just a, a single node with a single loop. I frame it and double it, and I get this quiver I've drawn on the left here. And this can be so, so another way to write this moduli space is, is this is the Nakajima quiver variety associated to this quiver. And so that consists of quadruples of matrices x1, x2, i, and j. So x1 and x2 go from cn to itself. I goes from uh, CR to CN, from the framing node to, to the node of my Jordan quiver. J goes the other way. And there's two conditions I want to put. So the, the first is a moment map condition. And that tells me that the commutator of x1 and x2 is equal. So I guess the sign isn't so important plus ij is equal to 0. And there's also some stability condition. And that tells me that if I look at the image of this uh, framing node of the vector space sitting at the framing of the CR, and I apply all possible polynomials in x1 and x2, I generate the whole vector space CN that sits at the node of my Jordan quiver. And this space comes with the action of uh, GLN. So GLN acts on CN by uh, conjugation, I guess. X on these operators by conjugation and acts on i and j as you'd expect. 
And the action of this torus T times A that I wrote earlier can also be realized in this quiver description as I've, I've written down here. So um, the T's scale X1 and X2, and to make the, uh, to, to preserve the moment map equation, then the, the T1, T2 will also scale J, and the framing torus just acts on I and J. Okay. And this space will carry two bundles that, that we're interested in. And so these I'll call V and W, the tautological bundle and, and the framing bundle. And so in this quiver description, the fiber over a given point is just the n-dimensional vector space that's, uh, that to which this, this node, the this CN descends to. And, and similarly with the framing bundle, the fiber at any, any point of instanton moduli space will just be the r-dimensional vector space sitting at this node. And so this is a, a rank N bundle and a rank R bundle. And this won't be so important for, for our purposes, but these, you, know, you can also write down what these are in, in the sheaf description. This maybe I'll be off by a dual here. So I could be writing down the dual, but it's not too important. And so recall this GLN acts at the, at the framing node. And so this V is some topologically non-trivial bundle. Um, but this, this W, there's no GLR acting. This W is, is, is uh, topologically trivial. But it's, it's important to note that it's equivariantly non-trivial. This framing torus A acts on, acts on these uh, fibers with some non-trivial character that, that we'll write down later. Okay. So let's see the most basic example of, of this space, and or I guess we'll get to an even the even more basic subclass, but but the easiest case is, is perhaps when R is equal to one. And then if I have such an X1, X2, IJ, I have this quiver data, it turns out it immediately follows from, from these equations that this map J is forced to be zero. And so what one gets is uh, this, this vector sitting at this, this blue node one, and, and the stability condition tells me that if I apply I to this vector, then I have to, I get a cyclic vector for the operators of X1 and X2. Uh, in other words, what I get is a map from, from the structure sheaf of C2 to some quotient. This tells me how X1 and X2 acts. And, and cyclicity tells me that this map is in fact surjective. And so here, this Q is some zero dimensional subsheaf at some, some subsheaf of points. And this, the fact that it's n-dimensional tells me that, that the Euler characteristic of this Q is n. And so this has another name. It's sort of, you know, finite, uh, finite length quotients of the structure sheaf. It's just the Hilbert scheme of n points on C2. OK, so we'll come back to this in a second. And so these results on, on quad schemes, it, it may be interesting for this audience to situate them in, in the kind of more general context of necrosive theory. And so in, in a line, what is that? That's just equivariant integration with respect to this torus I wrote down over these moduli spaces. Uh, MRM. And I, this probably isn't an audience I need to sell on the importance of these or, or the interest of, of these. But one reason algebraic geometers are, are interested in these is that they, they govern invariants cooked up from, from moduli spaces of sheaves on surfaces. And so you can, you can read about this in, in work of Gertrude Nakajima Yoshioki, uh, Yoshioka, Mochizuki, uh, as other people I wrote down here. 
And here's the kind of general calculus of, of how this goes. I'll put it in quotes because I'm not going to be precise. But if you have some kind of invariant that, that you can write over some moduli space of, of sheaves on a surface, then there's often some kind of, in this, you know, this will be something, I don't know, some, some expression. Then there's often some kind of wall crossing one can use. And these wall crossing terms, you know, you know maybe this depends on some, some class H. And, and as you vary, vary this class, the stability class uh, H, then the, the wall crossing is, is given by Hilbert schemes and, and sheave, or products of Hilbert schemes and certain sheaves over these products. Um, so using, using some kind of wall crossing, one can often write such integrals over products, say, of Hilbert schemes, over some kind of universal expression or some, some certain expression. Maybe I'll write question mark again. And then if this expression you're trying to integrate is universal, if it's cooked up by churn classes of universal families and universal sheaves living over these Hilbert schemes, then there's an argument of Ellings, Ruth, Gertrude, and Len. that lets you say write the same expression so maybe maybe equals is a bad sign maybe I want to write um, kind of reduces to for, for the same kind of expression for s toric And then by equivariant localization, this further reduces to the same where S is equal to C2. And then this last part here can be written in terms of Nicrosa functions. That is in terms of integrals over these instanton moduli spaces. Okay. So that is why you might care about these. Uh, so, so here's a, an example, or some some examples of of the kinds of functions you might be interested in. So the general form will be to fix some R. So I fix some rank of all my sheaves and I sum over all the possible second churn classes and have some variable Q that will, that will keep track of these churn classes. And I'm interested in the equivariant Euler characteristic of some class of sheaves living on each of these spaces. Um, and these are what are called K-theoretic necrosive partition functions. And so each individual coefficient of this series is some rational function in the variables of this torus T times A. And there's different sheaves you can put in, and, and depending what sheaf you, you put in, the function gets some different name. So for example, if you insert the structure sheaf, the, the simplest sheaf you could think of, you get what are, what are uh, called pure necrosis partition functions or uh, partition functions of pure gauge theories. You can put in You can put in, uh, say, the, the total exterior power with some variable keeping track of, of the exterior power you're taking of this tautological bundle V. And, and these are what are called uh, fundamental matter insertions. Or you can do the same thing. with a dual tautological bundle 
And these are what are called anti-fundamental. To put in the total exterior power of the cotangent bundle. And this is what is called adjoint matter. You could put some tensor product of, of all of these. Um, and depending upon you know, what insertions you put in, you'll, you'll get a more or less complicated necrosis function. So today, the, the quad scheme integrals I want to talk about kind of live at this level, the level of, of fundamental matter. If you're interested in integrals over nested Hilbert schemes or what are called monopole branches of, of alpha witten variants, those live here. Um, this, this kind of insertion here is what's also sometimes called the chi y genus. Okay. Is there anything else I wanted to say? Yeah. Yeah, and so a, a general question I have is, is you know, when and how can uh, can various properties so for example rationality or modularity of invariants associated to surfaces or sheaves you know spaces of sheaves on them from the surface invariants be determined or be, be kind of deduced from their descriptions using cross of functions. Okay. So let's start with, with the single most basic example of an across function, and that's just the, the Euler characteristic of the Hilbert scheme of points on C2. And so, I mean, probably the audience has, has plenty of experience doing these kind of calculations, but, but what is this? Well, so, so a priori, if, if you're not working with any kind of torus, even for one point on C2, I get some non-compact space. So this is, is infinite dimensional. But all the T weight spaces are finite dimensional. And when we work with higher regime, the T, T times A weight spaces will be finite dimensional. And, and so this expression here records the, the torus character of this Euler characteristic. Okay. So for example, if, if I have a single point, uh, then I'm just interested in the Euler characteristic of the plane. And that's just functions, uh, the spec of functions in, in two variables. And so I can record these functions and each monomial is its own T weight space. And so if I record the torus character of one, I get one. By convention, the, the action on functions is dual to the action on coordinates. So maybe if my T scales my coordinate axis in the, in the usual way, then, then the weight of uh, X1 will be T1 inverse, weight of X1 in squared will be t1 to the minus 2, and so on. Okay. 
And so if I sum all of these together to get the character, I can write that as a rational function. Let's open the answer. Equal to sum over all monomials in, in T1 inverse, T2 inverse, and, and that can be encoded in this rational function here. One over one minus T1 inverse times one over one minus T2 inverse. Okay. Another way to, to compute this is by equivariant localization. So what does that tell me? For, for now, we'll assume I have a smooth scheme with a, maybe you can say with Action. And for our purposes, it'll, it'll suffice to assume that this scheme uh, has isolated fixed points. There's no higher dimensional fixed loci. And equivariant localization in this very particular case tells me that I can write the Euler characteristic of functions on this scheme as a sum of contributions over each of the fixed points. So at each fixed point, I look at all the possible weights that occur in the decomposition of the tangent space, and I look at polynomial functions in the dual of these weights. So I take the product over all these weights of one over one minus the weight inverse. So in the example we had on the previous page, if m is equal to c2, there's an only one fixed point and tangent space to that fixed point decomposes as the weight of one coordinate axis, that's T1 plus the weight of another coordinate axis. And, and that tells me that Functions are just one over one minus the dual to one of these weights. Times uh, one minus one, one over one minus the dual of the other. Okay. What about for, for higher n? So, so now I want to compute the pure rank one Nekrasov function. And so what I need to know is the uh, Euler characteristic of functions on the helper scheme of endpoints. So there's a few ways to do this. Here's one of them. Uh, the first is to notice that the helper scheme of endpoints comes with the Hilbert Chamorism to the symmetric product. And this is a proper birational map. It's a resolution of singularities. And so the grau riemann scheider theorem tells me that the push forward of the canonical sheaf on the Hilbert scheme has all the higher direct images vanish. It has no higher direct images, but the Hilbert scheme of, of endpoints on C2 is a symplectic variety. And so that tells me So, so the canonical bundle and the structure sheaf differ by just a, a torus character. And so in particular, the same is going to be true for, for the uh, structure sheaf. The push forward of the structure sheaf will have no higher direct images. And I deduce that functions on the Hilbert scheme just coincide with functions on the opposition. That is the functions on the, the target. But functions on the symmetric product are the same as invariants for the symmetric group on, on the unfold product. And so if I want to sum these all together in a series, then I, uh, I can do so. And again, I can use this notation sim. 
it's just functions. in q times the character of functions on, on the helper scheme of one point. Sorry, this minus got lost in the shuffle. Okay, and so here, sim, if I have some infinite dimensional character, I can pick some cone in which to expand my rational function in T1 and T2. And sim tells me if I have some sum of monomials minus some other sum of monomials, I take all the monomials with positive coefficients and I, I put them in my denominator, take one minus them, and I take all my monomials that I'm subtracting and I put them in the numerator. So that's what's written here. Okay. So that's one way to, to compute this uh, pure rank one across a function. There's another way you can go back to equivariant localization and then you'll get some kind of argument involving box counting. And so how does that look? Well, I've written again at the top right how, how localization looks in the setting. And so the first thing we need to do localization are the fixed points. So the torus fixed points of the Hilbert scheme those just correspond to monomial ideals in the polynomial ring in two variables of co length n. And these are in bijection with Young diagrams lambda of, of size n. And so, how does that bijection look? Well, I take my, my Young diagram as pictured here, and I write the, the monomials that are there. And, and the ideal is going to consist of the monomials that, that aren't in this diagram. So here are some monomials that aren't in the diagram, and they turn out to generate the whole ideal. And so this corresponds to this ideal. And the character of this tautological bundle, um, I'll call V lambda, and, and so that's V restricted to lambda, and that also can be described in terms of this diagram. It's just the, the sum over boxes and lambda of the weight of the monomial appearing in the box. So for example, this is the first, so. If I have this, this partition I've drawn above, it's weight, this, this uh, the character of the fiber uh, at the corresponding fixed point is just the sum of these, these four monomials that appear in the box, sum of their weights rather. Is this sum. Okay. And so the, the last thing we need to do localization is we needed some description of the tangent bundle. And the tangent bundle has, uh, can be described as some quadratic function in, in terms of this, uh, this character V lambda. And so this can either be seen from, from the quiver description or, or by directly working with the description of the Hilbert scheme as a, as a um, moduli of, of sheaves. And, and this is the answer you get. And it turns out this answer can be written as a single sum of boxes and, and can be written combinatorially in terms of arms and legs. So for any box, the, the arm length is the number of boxes I have to walk to the right to get to the edge of the diagram. The leg length is the number of boxes I have to walk down to get to the bottom of the diagram. And, and I can record uh, my tangent character as a, as a sum in terms of these arms and leg lengths. And once I have that, I take, uh, I know my tangent weights, I can feed those into the localization expression to, to get um, an answer. And so what I've deduced is that this sum over all possible lambda is the um, total symmetric power of just functions 
on C2 multiplied by Q. And one can either show this purely combinatorially, starting from this expression in terms of arms and legs, or you know, we've, we've shown this geometrically by, by using this Hilbert Chow morphism. Okay. So I apologize if that was a, a bit slow for anyone, but uh, we'll pick up speed a little bit now. So that was the simplest case. If I just look at R is equal to one, what happens if, if I increase R? So here I'm still gonna look at pure gauge theories. Those will be pure rank R uh, necrosive partition function. So, so I still have my, my structure sheaf. And the first argument we, we ran doesn't immediately work, right? We, we don't have a Hilbert Chow mark as many more. The affinization of, of this instant time moduli space is, is Uhlenbeck space. So the, the symmetric product sits as, as one component, but there's these other components that, that make the argument um, not possible to work through. But we could still try doing localization and, and see what we get as an answer. So the first thing we need to, to do localization uh, is some description of, of the fixed points. And so first, if I look at just, so now we have this new torus acting A, if I look at the fixed points of instant time moduli space with respect to this torus A, then the, the fixed points break up as a bunch of copies of Hilbert schemes. Um, so a bunch of copies of, of Hilbert schemes whose total number of points in these R copies adds up to the second Turing class of, of the sheaf I want. And so if I then look at the uh, points in, in this product that are fixed by T, I just get R tuples of partitions. And the, the condition that my second turn class is N translates to the statement that the total number of boxes in all R of these partitions is equal to N. Okay. And so I can play the same game as before. So now I, I can extend this notion of the uh, this way to compute the, the tautological bundles at, at the weights of tautological bundles at fibers. And so now I'll, I'll let uh, V lambda one through lambda R be, be the weight of the tautological bundle at, at this point. And it'll record just as before the weights of, of all the monomials that appear in, in the boxes. That's this, this uh, V lambda I. And now it'll come with uh, a variable from this torus A that tells you which partition the the you know which, which uh, of the R partitions you're looking at. So um, the first partition will come with an A1 inverse, the second partition will come with an A2 inverse, and so on. And W will be the character of this other bundle. And at any fixed point, it'll have the same character. It's just the, the sum over I of, of all these AI inverse. So just like before, the tangent bundle at any fixed point will be some quadratic function of this V lambda, and, and now it'll incorporate this, this WI. And so this is the expression you get. You get W dual V lambda plus T1, T2, W uh, v, v lambda dual times this same kind of quadratic expression in these V lambda. And again, this has some kind of combinatorial interpretation. It's some sum over all pairs, lambda I, lambda J. It takes the quotient. Uh, AJ over AI. And again, there's some kind of expression. In terms of arms and legs. And I won't write down explicitly what that is, but one takes that expression and, and then plugs it in. You can take either of these expressions, and plug it in to, to the formula and you can compute and, and see what you get. And in contrast to, to the rank one case, the answer is, is more complicated. So it's not just a, a plethistic exponential of some simple uh, rational function. In contrast to this uh, 
we were looking at the Hilbert scheme without any uh, of this kind of A torus acting, but, but I want to emphasize that the answer does depend non-trivially on these variables AI. Um, I don't think there's any known closed form. For the resulting function, but but there is you know some something known about it. So it's studied via the so-called blow-up equation by Nakajima Yoshioka. And this gives you some recursion among the coefficients that that uniquely characterizes these equations. But still, it, it's and hard to extract kind of exact results for, for all the coefficients from there. And so I want to study some variant of this integral where you do actually get a nice answer. And what's the fix? The fix is that I'm going to impose the condition j is equal to zero. So, so in, the, in the rank one case, these equations automatically imply that j is equal to zero, but, but in higher rank, j needn't be zero. And so we can ask, okay, well, why not just impose it? And so what are we doing there? Well, we're, we're looking at the assignment, taking a, a quadruple x1, x2, ij to j. And, and this assignment is what? It's, it's a section of, the, of a certain bundle. All right, so it's of the bundle of, it'll be a rank r times n vector bundle. And if I keep track of, of the equivariance, it will be uh, this, this bundle given by T1, T2 times hum of, of the tautological bundle to the framing bundle on MRN. And, and what I want to do is look at the zero locus of this. of this section. So what happens? I have the same data as before. I have x1, x2. Now I've collapsed, uh, collapsed CR into R different vectors. And again, I have some moment map condition. Now that my, my j is equal to zero, the moment map condition is just that these matrices x1 and x2 commute. And stability tells me the same thing as before, that if I apply all polynomials in x1 and x2 to the span of my vectors vi, then I generate everything that sits at, at my gauge node cn. And again, I consider this data up to action by, to action of the GLN. And what I get looks quite similar to what I, what I had for the Hilbert scheme, only now I have R cyclic vectors. And so that corresponds to a surjection from R copies of the structure sheaf to a quotient. And again, the quotient is zero dimensional and of Euler characteristic n. And so this has, this has a name, this is the, it's called the quad scheme. It parameterizes zero dimensional length and quotients of R copies of, of the structure sheaf. So you can look at, there are quad schemes parameterizing quotients of, of other sheaves, but we'll just look at, look at a, you know, rank R copies of the structure sheaf here. So yeah, this is a quad scheme. And so what does this do? This realizes the quad scheme as the zero section of a rank, N, a rank R N vector bundle on, on a smooth space of dimension twice R N. And so what do we conclude? Well, as with any space that's presented as the zero section of vector bundle smooth space, this carries a perfect obstruction theory. Of dimension, the difference between the, the ambient space and the rank of the bundle, which is just Rn. And this obstruction theory uh, showed up before. So for example, the same 
DOT in work of Opreya Pandari Panda. Drew Johnson, Unam Lim, and, and so forth. Um, so another way to think of this obstruction theory is if I have some quotient and I look at say the kernel of the quotient, uh, S is the bad name, maybe K, that's a good name, or a kernel, then the, the virtual tangent space at, at this point would be the, the uh, alternating this alternating sum of x between uh, the kernel and, and the quotient. So, and you can check that these, these indeed give the same instruction theory. And so as we have this machinery that from, from any obstruction theory produces the sheaves needed for the virtual sheaves needed for enumerative computations. And we were careful to, to write down this bundle. So, so um, it was T by A equivariant. And so all of these constructions and, and the perfect obstruction theory are, are all T times A equivariant. So the sheaves are as well. Okay. And once you have such a description, uh, it's very easy to read off exactly who these sheaves are. So the, the virtual tangent space on the quad scheme is just the tangent space to the smooth ambient space, that's this MRN, and I subtract off my, my obstruction bundle. And then I restrict to, to the quad scheme. And to get the virtual structure sheaf, that's just the Kazul resolution associated to, to the um, section of this bundle. And so that's just the total exterior power of the dual of this obstruction bundle. So for example, even when R is equal to one, the, the points of the quad scheme are the same as, as the points of the Hilbert scheme, but the virtual tangent sheaf and, and virtual structure sheaf don't agree with the usual smooth analogs. And so it's worth down writing, worth writing down what they are. So the tangent space to the, the virtual tangent space of the quad scheme is the tangent space to the Hilbert scheme minus the obstruction bundle which turns out to be the tautological bundle is associated to the canonical bundle of, of the surface dual. And the virtual structure sheaf in that case is then the total exterior power of the tautological bundle associated to the canonical bundle. And so one, like in the smooth case, one, one has a, a notion of, of equivariant localization that's due to Graeber Pandre Panda and Fontaki Gertrude, and then there's other kind of treatments of this as well. And so instead of M being smooth, now we, we let M be some, some scheme with a, with a T, let's say equivariant, and maybe here, every time I write T, you should think of it as T times A. That's not, you know, don't worry about that. T equivariant, perfect obstruction theory. And I want to assume that, that uh, MT consists of isolated fixed points. And for the exact application, um, we also want to say that the T fixed part of the perfect obstruction theory vanishes at fixed points. And one has the same formula as before, only now all the sheaves are, are decorated with, with the symbol ver. So, so the virtual, uh, the, the smooth structure sheaf becomes the virtual structure sheaf and the tangent sheaf becomes the virtual tangent sheaf. And you, you have the same kind of equality here. And so how does it look for the quad scheme? So the fixed points of the quad scheme are the same as the fixed points of instanton moduli space. They're just parameterized by R partitions. And I've recalled the definition of what uh, V lambda and W are in this, this box of the upper right. 
And so, and then so here's this quadratic expression for, for the virtual tangent space to, to instant time moduli space. And if I want the answer for, for the quad scheme, I have to subtract off the obstruction bundle. And that obstruction bundle turns out to correspond to this middle term here. And so this, you know, this, uh, so this was a character of rank 2Rn. Here I've subtracted off this middle term, which is a character of rank Rn. So I get um, character of, of Rn. And this here is really some virtual character. So, so the character to instant time moduli space is just some sum of two Rn monomials. And, and this uh, virtual character is, is a sum and, and difference. There's negative, it's, it's a sum and difference of monomials. And I, the total uh, count with sign is, is Rn, some virtual character. But that's fine. And then for each of these fixed points, I compute this character and I can feed it into this expression here and see what I get. And it turns out that, like in the Hilbert scheme case, uh, the answer is nicely characterized in terms of the logistic exponential. And so the, the theorem uh, with Yasha. Is the following. The answer is just the plethistic exponential of whatever's going on at one point. And so that I can also write as the plastic exponential of Q times the um, or the characteristic of functions minus the other characteristic of uh, the tautological bundle on C2. And so some things to note in contrast to, to the, the smooth case in its time moduli space, here the answer is independent of these framing variables A. In this particular case, it's actually independent of the rank R. I get the same answer for, for any rank. And in the Hilbert scheme case, I mentioned that there is a kind of purely combinatorial argument. I mentioned there's a purely geometric argument. Yasha and I's argument mixes these. So, so the proof uses uh, geometry. So this, this Hilbert Chow morphism and, and factorization along the Hilbert Chow morphism. So one has, like in the Hilbert scheme case, a quata chow morphism and the localization description. I know, does it make sense for rank equals zero? Or? Does it make sense for rank equals zero? Um, what, what are the spaces in that case? There are There's some kind of stack of uh, torsion sheets without any, without any uh, section. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. You don't have to give answer in real time. It's just I know, uh, I know, but it, I, I, since I, it says I, independent of R. So. Yeah, yeah, but somehow, so these are quotients of nothing, but somehow have a surjective map from. No, there's there's still kind of you know zero dimensional schemes, but they don't. Whatever, zero dimensional sheets. There are zero dimensional sheets that have no section. We don't need this section. I, well, I don't know. We don't, maybe it's too complicated to address in real time. Okay, maybe, yeah, maybe I think about it afterwards. Um, okay, and so, you know, what does this say about Nekrasa functions? 
um, well, you know, directly from, from this uh, description as, as an abstraction bundle, we, we can tell that the, the Euler characteristic of the virtual structure sheaf is, is equal to the Euler characteristic of a particular uh, insertion on instant on moduli space. So that's just the total exterior power of this uh, dual to the abstraction bundle. And so this is uh, a Nekrasov, particular Nekrasov function with, I guess, our fundamental matter insertions. And so, yeah, this, this answer seems nice. Like I, I, surely this has to be written down somewhere else, but I've never, I've never seen it. It would be very interesting if, if there were other contexts in which people have seen this expression or in which people have, have um, more physical, more familiar with the physics literature have maybe seen this written down somewhere. I don't know. Um, okay. So how does this fit in with this earlier work I mentioned where, where this obstruction theory was also found? So here's, here's the expression uh, we, we found earlier, this, this theorem. And, and what if uh, the surface is projective? Well, then there's these results of, of Preya, Pandre Ponda, Lim, and Johnson, where they study series formed by the virtual Euler characteristic or the chi -Y genus or the virtual Euler characteristic with some descendants, and they show that these are rational. And in some sense, this result uh, Yasha and I have is, is kind of orthogonal, because if I try to specialize to a projective surface, well, by this ellingsford gertsch len argument I, I gave earlier, this, this formula is kind of universal enough that I can replace my C2 with S. And if I'm not working equivariantly, I'm, I'm just interested in, in the number, well, by Serre duality, the Euler characteristic of the structure sheaf and, and of the canonical uh, sheaf will be, will be equal. So we'll just get zero. And so the answer here is, is one. Okay. So that's, that's uh, maybe a little disappointing, but one can decorate this formula to extract answers that, that aren't trivial. So for example, I can put in, so, so the virtual structure sheaf was kind of our fundamental matter insertions with a, with a particular specialization. Maybe I should yeah, emphasize this is like a very particular spe specialization. And then I can, I can throw in also our anti-fundamental matter insertions. and no longer worry uh, about specializing them. And, and the answer I get is still quite nice. The answer we, we get with Yasha. Now will depend on the rank and, and depend on, on A. So it'll have the same prefactor as before, the Q times chi of O minus chi of K, um, but then there'll be some, some expression that depends non-trivially on these M's and A's. Ah, it's telling me my computer is low on battery. So let me get my charger. You can ponder this while I...
Okay, I apologize for, for the break. And so what if I wanted to say, uh, formulate a statement for projective S, I can, I can play the same game. And so now I, uh, I let alpha denote some rank at most R vector bundle on my surface. And I can look at, at the, uh, look at the uh, virtual Euler characteristic of the total exterior power of that vector bundle. And the answer again can be written in some kind of nice rational function. So the answer will be kind of trivial unless my vector bundle is of rank R. And now I'm tensoring this, this uh, determinant, if, if I'm in the rank R case, with O of S minus KS. So I may actually get a, a non-trivial answer here. Um, and so in particular, this, this Euler characteristic is, is always zero unless my, my vector bundle is uh, rank R and I'm looking at the determinant, the dual tautological bundle. And the statement that is also for, for higher rank R, um, the rank of my alpha, sorry, for higher rank vector bundles, is still true up to M degree R. So from these kind of equivariant statements, you can pretty easily extract statements for, for projective S um, in, in many situations. And so for, for context, um, maybe I'll mention very briefly some, some results obtained with uh, Johnson, Lima, Prey, and Pondre Ponda. Kind of using using different methods, so, so different kinds of arguments. These show that if I fix any particular exterior power and I take uh, any any vector bundles and I take fixed exterior pro, uh, fixed exterior powers of the tautological bundles associated to these vector bundles, and I look at their virtual uh, holomorphic Euler characteristics, I get rational functions. I can also put in exterior powers of uh, the virtual tangent bundle if I want, and I'll still get rational functions. Um, there's also similar statements in many cases for, uh, for let's say, for higher dimensional quotients. So for dimension one quotients, so instead of just quotients supported at points, they can be supported along some divisor in my surface. Uh, I can also look at rank one quotients. And those really make sense when, when my surface is of uh, geometric genus zero, so. And so in general, if I fix the exterior powers, I get some nice rational function. Um, it turns out this, I don't get a rational function in cobordism. So unlike in the threefold case where you expect invariance to, to be rational, both, both kind of if I extract uh, Euler characteristics and if I look at their cobordism, that doesn't seem to be true in, in the surface case. Um, and then, okay, here's a, here's a result I, I wanted to show that's also not proved using box counting techniques, but, but some kind of uh, interpretation using box counting or the geometry of, of three folds or, or something maybe even related to what I'm gonna say in the second part of the talk would be very interesting to me. And that's the following. So if I start with, with a surface S and, and a line bundle on it, and I fix N and then I pick two, any two integers, um, R and, and R prime, then the virtual holo, holomorphic Euler characteristic of the R prime power of the determinant of a tautological bundle over the quad scheme of rank R is the same as if I exchange R and R prime. So if I look at the determinant raised to the rth power, um, sorry, here, 
this second, this dark blue R is an R prime. That's the same as if I look at um, the determinant of the, the rth power, the determinant of the uh, tautological bundle associated with the line bundle raised to the rth power on a quotient of, of uh, quotients of R prime copies of the structure sheet. So it's much easier to read this than understand what I said, but, but so here it is. And, and my question or, or puzzle is, is there some box counting or threefold or quasi map kind of interpretation of this? I, I should say that in general, these series, if I sum over all n, don't give you rational functions in Q. You can get algebraic functions. So I don't know if that is a bad sign, but this, uh, yeah, I think this is a statement that for which some kind of enum another enumerative interpretation would be very interesting. So I'll, I'll let it sit there for a few seconds and then move on to the threefold part of the talk. Now would be a good time if, if you have any questions about the quad schemes on surfaces. No questions? Uh, Pieva can say a few words about where is there some general story where this 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 equality like that by steel fit or how did you prove it or where how did you guess it or yeah, I, so, so there's a slightly general story where, you know, if I'm interested in some kind of virtual integral over, over the quad scheme of some kind of genus, so, so cooked up from some functions, then there's some, some kind of general so, so maybe I have some, yeah, I have some kind of genus um, that's given by some power series. Then there's some kind of general conditions on these power series that, that will tell you when the functions are, are equal. Um, so, but if you look at what those conditions are, they're, they're a little opaque to me. So, so kind of algebraically, this dictates something and you can write down what that condition is uh, on, these, on these power series that, that, encode, that encode whatever genus you're looking at. But uh, as to the geometric understanding of these, it's, it's not totally clear. This particular um, statement kind of, it, this, so this particular equality fits into a kind of larger class of equalities. So um, this is like uh, one line of a, of a kind of cube of relations you can get. And so, so on, on one side, you have uh, maybe Tiver of, yeah, maybe, maybe it's, what's the best way to say this? So there's some kind of virtual Segray Verlinda correspondence for, for these surfaces. So, so on one hand, you have. some integral of, let's say the determinant of some, some uh, bundle on a surface, maybe raised to, to some power. This is related to the Segre class of some, uh, of some, the integral of some Segre class of a bundle related to this one. And then uh, both of these, if your surface has a canonical curve, are related to the same kinds of expressions over curves.
And then this kind of power series calculus is a bit easier to perform on, on the curve side when, when the fixed points are easier to describe and kind of once you understand what's going on for P1, then you've, you've pinned down um, how all these equalities work. So yeah, you have some kind of cube of equalities, one side of which corresponds to surfaces, one side corresponds to curves, or maybe one face and one face. One face corresponds to these for Linda series and one side, one face corresponds to the Segre series. And then another face corresponds to swapping this rank for the power of the determinant you're taking. Um, but, and, and so any of these equalities, well, I guess with the exception of how to pass from the surface to the curve, that's, that's kind of clear what that should be geometrically. But these other equalities I think would, would be very interesting to find geometric interpretations of. Um, yeah, I guess that's, maybe that's not the best answer to your question, but. Maybe now I move on to three folds then. So yeah, the same story for three folds can be thought of as some version of higher rank Donaldson and Thomas invariants. And so the quad scheme will look quite the same as in the C2 case, only now instead of taking our copies of the stretch sheaf of C2, I look at zero, uh, you know, zero dimensional length and quotients of our copies of the stretch sheaf of, of uh, C3. And so this again comes with the action of a torus. Uh, a rank R torus that acts uh, by permuting these, these uh, that acts on this framing that acts on, on uh, R copies of C3. And a three dimensional torus that comes from automorphisms of, of C3. And so in general, these spaces, unlike Hilbert schemes are, are highly singular And, and of unknown dimension. Even when R is equal to one. We saw this, I think, during Henry's talk. But one has a similar kind of description as, as a zero section of a vector bundle on some smooth space. So, so here's the smooth space. I'll go through this a bit quickly looking at the time. So now, now the smooth space is called uh, free three RN and it'll consist of three matrices. Um, so so that's, we can think of it as a quiver with, with three loops um, and a single incoming uh, arrow for coming from a node of, of rank R. And now there'll be no moment map or commutation relation, but there will again be a stability condition. So that tells me the image of this I consists of a set of cyclic vectors for these three operators, x1, x2, x3. And now GLN acts freely on this space. I can take the quotient and I get a smooth space. So I've reproduced the, the diagram here on the left. And I look at the function. So now I want to extract from this space the, the um, a space where these matrices do commute to correspond to, to uh, the quad scheme. And, and how do I do that? Well, I can look at this function from uh, on uh, the smooth function on my, my smooth ambient space. And that'll take a pair of matrices in this I to, to the trace of X1 times the commutator of X2 and X3. And it's a theorem of Centroy and, and Baron, Brian and Centroy in rank one and of Bindis for Kolfi and in the higher rank that the critical locus of this phi uh, coincides with, with the quad scheme. It's the same thing as, as this uh, quad scheme. So it's the set of matrices satisfying stability and such that these Xi commute. And what do we deduce from this? Now we deduce that, that the quad scheme carries a, again, equivariant perfect obstruction theory. Now this is the, the uh, it's the zero section of, of a bundle of the, of a, uh, you know, it's the critical locus of some function. So now the obstruction theory is in fact symmetric, right? So, so I, the obstruction bundle is, uh, is just the twist, an equivariant twist, where the equivariance comes from how this function transforms of the, the cotangent bundle. 
And so this is the particular twist. And now, again, I'm going to perform, I, I want to consider some function, which will be a sum as I vary the, the uh, possible length of these, these schemes. And it'll be the following. So I'll take a sum over n of now a variable. It'll be convenient to have minus q to the n, and it'll be convenient to raise that to the rth power. So I'll take minus q to the rn of, of uh, the Euler characteristic as a, as a t times a character of uh, the virtual structure sheaf, and it'll be convenient and, and kind of necessary to, to twist by a square root of the virtual canonical bundle. And so this will be the rank r partition function of, of the Hilbert, of the quad scheme, uh, the rank R quad scheme, let's say. And each of these Euler characters is some rational function in T1, T2, T3, and the square root of their product, and these variables, aj. And again, one has some box counting interpretation. So now, um, instead of monomial ideals and a polynomial ring in two variables, I have monomials, uh, monomial ideals and a polynomial ring in three variables. And the total co-length of these ideals is n. And so these correspond to R tuples of 3D partitions, whose the total number of boxes uh, is, is n. So here, it's, so here there's three partitions. If I count the number of boxes in each of the, in these solid partitions, the total number is 33. And so this is a fixed point of uh, quad C3, 3, 33. And I have a similar kind of description of the character of these tautological bundles and, and framing bundles, which are defined in, in the same way as before. So the fiber, um, let's say if I have a, just a rank one quad scheme, if I have a, if a single partition, then I'll record those in some character, which I'll call V sub pi. So it'll be the sum over all boxes of the weight of the monomial appearing in that box. And so for example, for this partition with four boxes, The corresponding character is one plus t1 inverse plus t2 inverse plus t3 inverse. And ooh, in the higher rank situation, I take a sum over all of these partitions of the character of those partitions, and I weight that character by a, one of my variables for my torus A, which, in, which kind of keeps track of the order in which these partitions come from. It keeps track of where in the sequence this partition lives, and I'll call that um, V sub pi. And again, the character of this framing, w bun uh, framing bundle W is the sum over all of the AI inverse. And so in this, uh, if it, so again, one has some comb combinatorial formula in terms of these W and, and V pi for the character of the virtual tangent space at the quad scheme of points on, on C3. And it's given as follows. So it looks quite the same to, to what we had for the Hilbert scheme of points on uh, C2, only now instead of subtracting, or instead of adding a second term, we subtract the second term. And we get something like this. And this is a, a rank zero virtual character. So if you've never seen it before, this exact expression isn't too important to internalize. Just the fact is that it exists. And the, the virtual tangent character, okay, I've repeated it above. And what does virtual localization say in this case? It says I take a sum over all R tuples of partitions um, of minus Q to the R times the total number of boxes in that R tuple times uh, the times some function that's read off from, from the character. So here, if the virtual tangent space at pi is some sum, let's say vi minus ui. So it's a rank zero character, so we can write it in this form. Then, 
to get this contribution here, we feed in the following. So it's just a slightly upgraded version of, of what we had in, in the case of the quad scheme of rank two, where we have some uh, virtual character that can be computed combinatorially and we feed it into this expression. And the theorem with, with Yasha and then shown independently by Fasoli, Monavari, and Rokolfi using a slightly different argument is that again, the, the resulting partition function has the description in terms of the plastic exponential. Um, here it's a bit more complicated, so I'll, I'll write it down and then I'll say some things that will help clarify perhaps where this comes from. So there'll be some prefix. And then there'll be some term that won't depend on R at all. Okay, so this is a this is some expression. It's it's a big expression, but it's not so bad. So first of all, this piece here, the second piece in the product, this is just the same expression. Um, so this is the contribution again of the Hilbert scheme of one point on C three. So as as in the quad scheme case where there was this one point on C two that showed up over and over again, this is now one point on C three. One thing to note is that there's, again, no dependence on these variables A. When R is equal to one, this was a conjecture of Nekrasov and proved by Andre. And for higher R, this was a conjecture of Awada and Kana. Okay. So who is this character? So I've rewritten it um, above with some slightly condensed notation where this bracket denotes uh, the difference between the square root and then the square root, the inverse of the square root. And the answer here suggests that this variable Q should be put on, on similar footing with the rest of these variables TI. And so how am I gonna do that? Well, let me set two new variables, so T4 and T5. And I'll set T4 to be Q over um, the square root of kappa to the one half. So here kappa is just the character of the anti, the weight of the anti-canonical bundle. It's just the product of T1, T2, T3. So maybe I'll Write that down here again to make it clear. And T5 will be one over uh, kappa. Again, uh, maybe, I don't know why. That's better. And, and uh, okay, so I have my T4 and T5 and I'll have some cyclic group of order R, that's mu R, that will act on this pair T4, T5 by, by scaling T4 by, by uh, something, and, and then T5 will be, will be scaled by, by the inverse of, of that element of the cyclic group. Um, and so then how can I rewrite this expression, that this, this big expression on the top? Well, here's my T4 and T5. 
And it can be written uh, pretty simply as, as the, cement, the uh, platonic exponential of one over bracket T4, T5, and then times this product that comes from the Hilbert scheme of one point. And I take the mu r invariance uh, of this whole expression. So that's the mu r invariance of the same expression in the case when r is equal to one. And so what, what is there to be said about this expression? Well, ignoring the twist, this prefix, this, this one over t4, t5 in brackets, this looks like functions on the resolution uh, on the AR minus one surface that, that we also saw in, in Henry's talk. They look like functions on uh, the resolution of C2 mod, the sixth group mu r. And so what's another way to, to write this uh, Z3 CR? Well, I can take Y to be equal to C5 and look at an action of these five variables, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5 on Y. And this induces an action on, on the resolution of this quotient by mu r. So I have some fivefold, and, and this character inside of, of the platonic exponential on the previous page can be written in terms of a certain character over this, in terms of a certain other characteristic over this fivefold yr, that's c3 times c2. And so here we've seen that this parameter Q does have this geometric meaning we've been promised. It, it appears as a certain automorphism of this fivefold mu r. So I look at this character. I extract the, the part of this character that moves in Q. So if I expand as a rational function uh, in Q and I, I discard the constant coefficient, and then that matches up with, with the argument of this platonic exponential on the previous page. On the other hand, what else could I do? Instead of looking at C3, I could replace C3 by, by a different surface. I could replace it by just uh, C times the C2 mod mu r. So I could, I could Instead of looking at the, the threefold given by the first, uh, the first factor of this product, I could break up that factor and then look, uh, look at the series formed by the length one quotients by, by the Hilbert scheme on C mod the product with mu r. And then if I relabel those variables, so if I have t4, t5, t1, t2, t3 now acting on y, this again induces an action on this y sub r. And I can rewrite um, the, the sum of, as, of, of all these Euler characteristics over Hilbert schemes in the same way. It's some Euler characteristic over the, of the same uh, expression over this fivefold, and I again extract the Q moving part. So by changing how this Q uh, acts on this particular fivefold Y, I can extract either the rank R expressions for, for, um, for quad schemes on, of, of rank one quad schemes on a more complicated surface, uh, or I can extract the information for rank R quad schemes on, on C3. And so here's a, a picture of that. So how do the fixed points look in each case? So if I look at rank R quotients on C3, what I have are R copies of C3, and there's some interaction between, so I get R different partitions, these pi one through pi R, and there's some kind of interactions between these partitions that's mediated by the torus, this, this A torus, these, these, A, these variables A1 through AR. And on the other side, on this rank one side, I again have R fixed points. Now, um, one is, so, so the torus acting on C times C2 mod mu R. If I look at the, um, that, tor the, kind of that torus has R fixed points, that gives rise to R fixed points. Um, that, that tells me that each partition is again gonna be given by, by R fixed points. So now I have, sorry, each fixed point on the Hilbert scheme is gonna be given by R partitions. 
And now there's no kind of interaction between these partitions. The expression really just breaks up as a product over each of these fixed points with no interaction between them. Um, but there are different T weights at each fixed point. And in particular, on this side, there's no, no AIs that appear. And so this fits into a, a more general framework. So maybe this is a lot for the last you know, three minutes of the talk, but so be it. So if conjecturally, if I, and, and we heard a little about this uh, a couple of weeks ago in Yasha's talk, where if I have some Calabia fivefold Y and I have some torus, some rank one complex torus that acts on Y preserving the Calabia, uh, pre yeah, preserving the Calabia form, such that the fixed locus with respect to this torus is pure three dimensional, then there are these conjectures of Nekrasov and Kunkov that expect some relationship between DT invariance or PT invariance of, of this fixed locus Y and some conjectural invariant, which we heard about in, in Yasha's talk. Called the, the M2 index. And these kind of results from the previous page are an instance of perhaps the simplest version of, of this relationship, where on one side, I extract the degree zero invariance. So I don't look at anything supported on curves. I just look at, at the contribution of points. And the expression one gets is some Euler characteristic over the Hilbert scheme of points and the fixed locus on this y. But it's possible that my fixed locus is disconnected. And indeed, that's the case for, for um, this, these higher rank versions we were interested in. And so there's some kind of interaction term between components. And we saw that interaction term given by these, these AI. And on the other side, One's extracting what I believe are called the fields of M theory. So there are no membranes, just fields. And this should be given by some symmetric product. So again, one takes the other characteristic of the cotangent bundle minus the tangent bundle over this five folds and extracts the Q moving piece. And so in particular, if I have two different tori that act in my Y with pure three-dimensional fixed loci, then I predict some explicit relationship between the invariance of the, the fixed locus of this, uh, with respect to one of these tori and the fixed locus with respect to another. And so in the particular case we had, which was some five-fold that was formed from the product of C2 and uh, C and uh, an AR minus one surface, we could have a torus that just acts on this first factor. So the fixed locus there is a, is a point and the fixed locus, or if we, we act on this third factor, then the fixed locus consists of R points. And so on one side we have, uh, so maybe here we have sim of I of Y T star Y minus T Y. And on one side, we can extract the Q prime moving piece, and we get the generating series formed from the Hilbert scheme, or rank one quotients. 
And on the other side, we can extract the, the Q moving, the yellow moving piece. And there we get the function formed by the rank R quad scheme on C3. And similarly, one can, can, act, can also take a quotient by some finite cyclic group on this first factor, right? So, so well, there's no reason I can't do that. And then I would get an analogous relationship between quotients of, of rank R sheaves on, uh, on an AS minus one surface times C and quotients of rank S sheaves on an AR minus one surface times C. And both of these would be related again to extracting some piece of the plethysmic exponential of the character of this bundle over, over the fivefold. So here I extract Q moving part and here I extract Q prime moving part. And to do this, you have to find uh, an obstruction theory of, of rank R quotients on this particular threefold here. And that can be done again by some explicit clever description. Um, maybe I should conclude by saying that, that even here, there's something that's maybe slightly interesting to me that's, that, that goes on, where in, in the original matching, if you want to match up PT invariance with, uh, with these M2, in, uh, indices, then you have this extra torus, this extra, these extra A variables, and they, in, in this membranes and sheaves picture, uh, need to be matched with some curve classes. But in, in the complete absence of curves, you can still keep these uh, AIs around, and you don't have to specialize them to anything to match up with, with this uh, plethysmic exponential. They, they immediately kind of cancel out from the product without any sort of specialization. Um, so, yeah, that's a if, you're, if you've seen this kind of matching for, for PT invariance, maybe that means something. If not, then, then um, maybe I'll leave it there. Yeah, sorry for running a bit over. Thanks. Thanks, Noah. That was great. Questions? Well, I had a few. Maybe I'll ask them first of all, people sure. think about questions. First, when is that paper with Yasha coming? Or there are more than one paper? How many? There's one, it's, it's, I, uh, soon-ish, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, soon-ish. <laughs> cool. And uh, also it's, uh, so that. this is, um, you know, with they, like, speaking of this very last tra transparency we have on screen, so when it, yeah. you track the Q moving part just to have, a, like, a good match with the Q series, but in principle you can think that the, the Q is on the other, series on the other side, you can, you know, it doesn't need to start with one, it could start with something like a perturbative contribution. Yeah. And uh, the, does, it, does it also match in this formula or is it, uh, or, didn't, or uh, hmm. you, if you didn't think about it, it's okay, but if it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I mean, maybe we can even talk about this sometime. I'm not totally sure how to find these perturbative contributions. You, you just apply, so you, I mean, in, in order in your the theory to find perturbative contribution, you, uh, you apply something to like a trivial sheaf, you compute it to kind of abstraction, to, like, you know, like compute like a tangent space to a trivial sheaf or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then you space to O, in principle, that's if, if you do it in, uh, if we do it for like C2, this is going to be an infinite dimensional space. And, but you can uh, regularize this K theory class by some sort of infinite product. That's, and that was going to be, so it's going to be sim of something. So that's a, that's something yeah, I would, I would guess, I would guess if it, my naive guess is that, that if this, yeah, if you can write down what these, what this should be, then it, it, it yeah, it that'd be, be my to guess check. too. I think it's something yeah. to check. Also, yeah. uh, another question is uh, in this threefold story, it's sort of, you know, it's kind of important to have this uh, square root of the virtual canonical. Yeah. Uh, whereas there's in the surface story, you work directly with uh, directly with the just uh, O O virtual. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, um, should, what should I ask? 
Uh, so the question, well, I guess the question is, so if, if you take just, just if you just take um, uh, like instant on moduli, they're of course uh, symplectic and so their virtual canonical is just pure, is just pure weight, it doesn't have anything else. Mm -hmm. But if you're, uh, if you're doing this uh, uh, for, um, for the quad schemes, they, uh, their instruction theory is not symmetric, so maybe you can, is that, is that somehow impo important to do it with over, or we can do it with overhead, or it's, a, or it's a secretly hidden among some other variables you already have, or? It's, it's not hidden. Yeah, I, I, my, it's, it's like the usual kind of, geometric engineering of these things where where mm -hmm. if you if you this is it's not a perfect answer right but but if you you know if you want to produce some euler characteristic over instanton moduli space even if you want to produce o you start mm -hmm. with with this twist by caver on the threefold side mm -hmm. so it it seems like in general if if you know even if you start with caver on on a threefold side and want to say something about a surface then what you still end up getting is is just uh, untwisted on the on the surface okay. side. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. More question for people. Oh, no, no, nobody gets uh, points <laughs> for all this participation <laughs> That's not a good today. Sign. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nobody, nobody gets points. However, uh, so I, I remind everybody the next week we meet at a different time, and and uh, so that uh, please pay attention to that, and uh, and then this is uh, well, hopefully big. I mean, we, I'm, I'm quite certain it'd be <laughs> very, very, uh, very worth your. Uh, your effort to uh, change your schedule to accommodate for it, uh, for that talk. Well, thanks now again, then maybe yeah. we'll see everybody next week. Yeah. yeah.